Okay, welcome everybody to uh, Advances in Boreal Disturbances Research uh, Part 2. Uh, my name is Pete Whittington from Brandon University, and I'm helping uh, chair this, or chairing this session. Our first speaker is Lauren Summers, talking about the high rates of methane oxidation in tropical peatland drainage canal, moderate methane emissions. Joey Lauren. So for all speakers, uh, I will turn my video on at about the 12 or 13 minute mark. If I think that I can tell that you're wrapping up, then I won't interrupt you. But if you're still cranking through uh, results or methods at the 12 or 13 minute mark, then I'll uh, I'll speak up. All right, great. Thanks. So yeah, my name's Lauren Summers. I'm an assistant professor at Dalhousie University. Um, you're going to notice pretty quickly that that my talk is not actually about a boreal landscape, um, but it is a peatland landscape. So hopefully you get something uh, out of it regardless. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about work that was part of my postdoc, all about tracking methane emissions and oxidation in tropical peatland drainage canals. Um, so we know peatlands are a really important terrestrial carbon store. Um, and Southeast Asian peatlands have undergone a really dramatic landscape change in the last 30 years. Um, so more than 90% of these peatlands have been degraded in some way. So around half of, of Southeast Asian peatlands uh, have been converted uh, to forestry or uh, um, oil palm plantations. Um, and this involves lowering the water table with drainage canals. Um, so here, here are two photos of uh, drainage canals in uh, oil palm plantations. And then a map from a recent study showing the density of drainage canals on, on peat soil in Southeast Asia to give you an idea of um, the scale of how dramatic this hydrologic change has been. So there are a bunch of consequences for peatland drainage. Uh, you're lowering the water table, so you're increasing carbon dioxide uh, emissions uh, because of that accelerated breakdown of organic matter. Um, that causes land substance as well and increased risk of peat fires. Um, but what about the impact of, of this peatland drainage on methane emissions? So on one hand, uh, you have less saturated thickness um, of the peat for uh, methanogenesis. But on the other hand, you're sort of creating all these new locations where uh, gas bearing pore water can upwell um, and potentially degas to the atmosphere. And, and some studies have suggested that um, these drainage canals are sort of hot spots for methane degassing, but there's very few studies on this. Um, and the fluxes that they observe are really highly variable. So our research questions here are first, uh, what happens to that methane that gets advected or carried with groundwater flow into drainage canals? Um, how much of that methane gets um, oxidized by methanotrophic microbes um, to carbon dioxide? How much of it is, is degassed or emitted to the atmosphere? And how much of it is re remains dissolved in the, uh, in the canal water uh, and flows towards the ocean? So that's question one. Question two is, so then how important is that degassing, that, um, that methane emission from canals relative to um, the rest of the methane emissions for disturbed tropical peatlands. Uh, and the way we're gonna get at those processes is by using stable carbon isotopes. Um, so in the presence of oxygen, uh, methane is readily oxidized to carbon dioxide by those methanotrophic microbes. Uh, and during this process, um, the lighter carbon, carbon 12, has a faster reaction rate than carbon 13. So as this uh, reaction happens, the methane becomes enriched in carbon-13 and the carbon dioxide becomes depleted in carbon-13. And that process is isotopic fractionation. And the strength of that effect is described by our fractionation factor. So we wanna apply these principles to our field data. So our field site uh, here was in uh, Brunei, um, which is a small country on the island of Borneo in Southeast Asia. And we're focusing on a, uh, an area called the Badass Peatland, uh, which has peat deposits about six to seven meters thick. And the peat dome is drained by one central straight line drainage canal that was uh, um, excavated about 50 years ago. Um, and so as a result, there have been um, fires kind of along that drained peat close to the canal. Um, so you can see outlined in, in white there. And uh, we've collected two data sets from this peatland, one from January and one from August uh, 2020. 
And what we collected were water samples that we analyzed for um, dissolved methane, dissolved carbon dioxide or, or DIC, uh, since we have uh, an acidic, acidic peat water here, and then the uh, delta 13C of methane and, and carbon dioxide. Um, so we're, we're, yeah, we're analyzing those four things and we took samples in kind of two, um, uh, in two dimensions, the uh, one is along the canal. Um, so every approximately 400 meters along this five kilometer straight line canal. Um, and we see generally decreasing gas concentrations along the canal. So we're seeing kind of consistent processes. Um, and then we also took a lot of pore water samples as well. So uh, we need to characterize the water that's uh, entering the canal and that is that pore water. And we did that in um, these vertical profiles of, of water samples through, uh, through the peatland. And so we can kind of get these cross-section views of the gas concentrations and the, the isotopic ratios as well. And the one thing I'll point out from, from this is just that the gas concentrations uh, and isotopes below the canal are very different than beside the canal. So we do need to kind of take that into consideration in the way that we process this data. Um, so we want to use that gas and isotopic data um, from the field uh, to back out what's happening to methane in the canal. Um, so we developed a, an isotope mass balance model uh, to get at that question. Um, so the, starting with the methane uh, side of things, uh, we're accounting for, for three processes and we're calculating these along the canal. Um, so the first thing is groundwater input or pore water input from both the shallow and deep pore water. The second thing is oxidation of methane to carbon dioxide in the canal. And the third is that uh, degassing at the canal surface. Um, and so we can write this one dimensional differential equation to describe those processes uh, as you move along the canal. Um, and uh, just in terms of the isotopes, the only process here that's fractionating isotopically is this microbial oxidation. So that allows us to actually differentiate between oxidation and uh, degassing. And then for carbon dioxide, uh, we need to account for an additional process, uh, which is a dissolved organic carbon oxidation to carbon dioxide, which can be driven by solar radiation um, and microbial oxidation as well. So we have a slightly uh, different, um, but the very similar form of the mass balance model for carbon dioxide. Um, so we take those two equations and actually rewrite them in terms of the individual isotopes that we're interested in. So uh, we've got four model equations then, one for methane with carbon-12, methane with carbon-13, one with uh, DIC with carbon-12, and one with DIC with carbon-13. And those four equations make up our model. We have a number of uh, input constants as well as six fitting parameters that go into the model. Um, and then the model spits out these simulated concentrations of, of gases and uh, isotopes along the canal. And then we use a, a, a nonlinear regression to find the best fit parameters to uh, fit to our field data, which we have for both uh, for kind of two, two time periods, January and August. Um, so let's see how well our model was able to, to match our, our field data. Um, so here's half of the canal data to start. Um, we've got uh, on the x-axis, we have the distance downstream. So from zero to five meters down, uh, five kilometers downstream. Um, and we've got DIC concentrations here on the top and uh, Delta 13C of DIC on the bottom. So we're seeing these consistently decreasing trends in, in all of these variables. Um, and then here are our uh, best fit simulation results. So the red line is the simulated concentration or isotopic ratio. And then the dotted line is the 95% confidence interval. Um, so we're able to match our observed field data uh, fairly well with our model formulation. And then looking at the same thing for our methane, again, we've got decreasing gas uh, concentrations as you move downstream and a little bit more noise, a little bit uh, less monotonic in terms of the methane isotopes. Um, but generally, we are able to uh, match that field data as well um, with our, our model. Um, so we've done a, a model fit, that's great, but what does that tell us about the system and how does that allow us to answer our research questions? So it's actually those fitting parameters that now kind of describe our system and here's what we can pull out of that. Um, so the, our first research question was, 
how much methane is oxidized, degassed, or transported towards the ocean. And so here is the, uh, the methane budget for the Badass Canal. Um, so uh, of the uh, methane advected into the canal, 72% of it was actually um, oxidized in the canal. Um, and then 25% of, of what came in ended up being degassed or admitted to the atmosphere. And 3%, the remaining 3%, it was still dissolved in the canal as it left the, as it left the catchment. Um, so quite a bit of methane comes into the canal, but most of it is being um, oxidized in the canal. Um, well, you, can, you may also notice here that the, the dark gray bars are, are longer than the white bars, and that's because the uh, August that had sort of more moderate flow conditions, because there was more flow, there was actually more um, pore water discharging into the, into the canal, and that results in, in higher, uh, higher sinks. So the emissions of uh, methane were higher in August, so around nine kilograms per day compared to January, which was about six kilograms per day. Um, and then our fitted model also tells us something about the spatial distribution of, of these fluxes. So it suggests that um, at the upstream kind of stagnant end of the canal, where you actually have higher dissolved concentrations, you have lower um, surface fluxes because the, of the um, lower amount of surface turbulence in, in the water there um, compared to downstream. And that's one reason why um, floating chambers might not capture these fluxes very easily. Um, and then the second research question was, uh, how important are drainage canals to tropical peatland methane emissions overall? Um, so if we uh, take our, our emission rate and divide it by the canal area, that gives us this, this flux from the canal. Um, and if we compare that to different types of disturbed peatland land cover from literature, um, so these are median values from literature studies. And we can see that the canal is, has a higher aerial flux than a lot of those, those other types of land cover. Um, so in one sense, it is sort of a hot spot uh, in terms of aerial flux, but it only, canals of course only cover a small part of the total catchment area. So if we uh, multiply all of our fluxes by the areas for our catchment here, badass, we see that the canals are um, less than 1% of the area, but only account for 7% of um, methane emissions overall. Um, part of that is because we have uh, pristine and drained and burnt peatlands in this catchment, which have higher emission rates. So if this was like an oil palm plantation, you might expect those canals to be a larger proportion of overall methane emissions. Okay. Um, so the takeaways from this work are first that uh, actually quite a bit of methane seems to be advected into drainage canals and it mostly comes through uh, the shallower peat compared to the deeper peat. We learned that from our, our fitting parameters. Um, second, the, the majority of that methane that's coming into canals is being oxidized, um, but the remaining 25% that is being degassed sort of makes these canals a, a substantial but not a dominant contributor to the methane balance of uh, the badass uh, peatland. Um, and then we also kind of learned about the spatial distribution and that more methane seems to be emitted at, at higher flows. So I'll finish by just acknowledging my, my co-authors and collaborators uh, that were part of this work in Singapore, Brunei and the US. So thank you for listening. Excellent. Thanks, Lauren. And that's got to be one of the coolest site names. Do we have any questions? We've got uh, just about a minute uh, or so for a question. Thanks, David. No questions. OK, well, that's fine. We'll get our next uh, speaker set up then. This video. Great. So our next speaker uh, is Vidya Sharma talking about horticultural peat. I guess the title in the program is different. I'll just read your title slide. So horticultural peat biogeochemistry in CO2 emissions. So again, 
At about the 12 minute mark, I'll turn my uh, camera on if I don't think you're wrapping up. Okay, well, um, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pitya and I uh, am calling in from McGill University. And uh, today I'll be presenting part of my PhD thesis. Um, just want to acknowledge my co-authors from, from, from the department, from uh, Earth and Planetary Sciences at McGill, as well as uh, University of Munster in, um, in Germany. So, in terms of land area, only 0.03% of total peatland area in Canada is currently harvested for, uh, for horticulture purpose. Um, it might seem like a small uh, portion, but it's just because there's a vast, uh, vast uh, peatland uh, in, in, in Canadian landscape. However, it is, it is very, uh, horticulture peat is very important for food production as well as for, um, and it's, and majority goes for food production, but also for ornamental plants, like the house plants that you may have uh, might use peat um, and also for soil augmentation in gardens and so forth. And this is, these are sort of images of what horticulture peat use looks like. Um, in Canada right now, um, of everything that is extracted, 85% around is exported mainly to United States. Um, and there is 15% is used uh, for mushroom production from ca for cannabis, um, for, for food production and, uh, and for ornamental plants. So, and in terms of how much of extraction is average annual of 1.3 million tons. And um, currently the emission factor of one is used um, for horticulture repeat um, for, um, for like national emissions. Um, however, we probably can think of from a carbon perspective that um, the mass loss follows sort of an exponential decay and that not all um, the carbon that is extracted will be lost in a single year. While there is an active uh, research going on in terms of alternative growing media, like you might have heard terms like coconut coir or rock wool, a viable, um, viable alternate has not been yet identified, uh, especially in a scale that can be used for, um, for commercial grow growing, for ornamental potentially, but for uh, commercial growing of food production, um, a viable alternate yet is yet to uh, is yet to be identified. So in this scenario, it becomes important. It becomes really important to know what the uh, emissions are when peat is used for uh, for for horticultural purpose, and that's where um, where this works comes uh, into place. Um, but uh, first thing first, uh, horticulture. So if we know a bit about peatlands and peat, we know that um, they are very nutrient and um, limited and also very uh, acidic. So, you know, not so great for the plants. So um, a, lot of, a lot of its uh, properties um, need to be adjusted so that it can be used as growing substrate. So for the purpose of this presentation, what I call peat is just this acidic peat, and, uh, peat that we know of. And what is growing substrate is when all the horticultural additives have been added uh, to make it more um, beneficial for the plants. But while we do that, while we make it more, um, neutral in it in its acidity and as well as make it make more favorable nutrients available we also uh, potentially increase uh, soil heterotrophic respiration so the, and so to to um, so the questions that I will be discussing today is what are these differences between peat and growing substrate because there is vast majority of literature that exists for peat biogeochemistry that we know of but there is not much available in terms of uh, biogeochemical properties of growing substrate. So once, uh, once we know the properties, so what, what does it look like for uh, short-term CO2 fluxes? Um, and if, I, if we look at this slide back again, so when we are adding additives, uh, there are sort of carbon-based additives like limestone and dolomite that are being added in the growing substrate that would also 
<clears throat> when we are measuring CO2 emissions, which is what I did and which I'll explain in a bit, um, it becomes important to uh, partition out source of, uh, of CO2 that is uh, measured. So the third question is whether these carbon-based additives, mostly um, limestones and dolomites, have a direct contribution to the CO2 fluxes that, uh, that we measured. So uh, in terms of methods, uh, we con contacted different extraction companies in Quebec and Alberta, uh, four in total, and we asked for a range of their uh, product line. So uh, this would be different depending on their end use at uh, which they will be put to, especially for um, growing, uh, growing substrate. And we measured uh, a bunch of biogeochemical properties as well as um, CO2 uh, using incubation and also 13 carbon concentration in, um, in, the CO, in the emitted CO2. So coming to the results, so um, here we have all the biogeochemical properties that have been, um, that, that, that we measured in this PCA. And it's a, it's a lot of things, but I think the, the key takeaway message I want to po point out here um, is like a clear separation in biogeochemical properties, in most of the biogeochemical properties between uh, peat and gold growing substrate. And also another thing I want to point out is the variability. So like peat, peat all, the, all our peat sample themselves are sort of like less variable in their properties, whereas for growing substrate, it is sort of very, uh, it has a large variability and potentially it's because, you know, it's four different companies and it's a very, um, so each product line has a very different properties uh, at, the, at the end. Um, so yeah, so um, to conclude uh, this slide is they have very different biogeochemical properties as well as uh, microbial properties. Um, however, the key question remains if this translates into higher um, carbon loss from the growing substrate. So to get to that, what uh, we needed to do is to identify uh, the carbonate, the influence of the carbonate. Um, so here in this sort of thought experiment, what we have here is, um, so the red line here is peat and the, the, the blue line is growing substrate. So when first calcium carbonates is added, um, the CO2 emissions are quite high. However, uh, it turns out they have sort of, they, they don't completely um, are, uh, leave the system, but sort of remain uh, for a long time. Um, however, because of their very different in uh, 13 carbon isotopic signature, we can use uh, what's called Keeling plot method and two-way mixing model to differentiate um, the, the source of CO2. Either it's coming from peat or it's coming from calcium carbonate. And when we know it's coming from calcium carbonate, because uh, we can, you know, um, subtract the amount to uh, get to the peat CO2, which is uh, which is a prime interest for uh, for this purpose. So um, to show what the 13 carbon uh, CO2 composition looks like for uh, peat and growing substrate. Uh, for peat, it's sort of, you know, again, less variable within sort of what we expect from minus 25 to minus 27 per mil. And for growing substrate, it's more, uh, more variable. Uh, again, different companies, different product lines. So it gives us a wide range of very uh, possibilities in um, 13 carbon concentration. So um, once, once we identify how much of, uh, of the total C uh, CO2 that we were seeing was from carbonates, we subtracted the carbonate fraction from growing substrate and plotted out this graph where it is only peat-based carbon loss uh, for peat um, because the, the peat sample itself doesn't have any carbonate uh, influence, but also for growing substrate, the, the plot that is here is after having subtracted out the isotopic um, contribution, the contribution from, um, from the carbonates. Even, even after that, we see that um, the growing substrate have higher um, CO2 emissions than compared to, uh, to, to peat. Um, and this difference is highly uh, statistically significant. 
So uh, next we looked at key associations. And the first one that I wanted to point out was um, for, for the red one for peat, um, there is an increase in, um, in CO2 emissions with increase in organic matter content, which um, intuitively makes sense because there will be higher substrate availability when, the, when there is high organic matter content. Um, however, when we look at growing substrate for the same relationship, it's, it's, it's sort of flipped. So whenever, when we have more towards, uh, more towards mineral, um, mi mineral interface, right? So it, it becomes higher um, CO2 loss. And uh, so potentially what's happening is when a lot of inorganic um, additives are added in, grow in growing substrate, um, it reduces the organic matter content, but makes it more favorable uh, for, for, the, uh, for carbon loss in, uh, in these samples. Um, however, when we look at uh, dissolved organic carbon, both, uh, both, both the groups have similar, um, similar uh, properties that higher DOC um, sort of makes higher uh, carbon loss in both, uh, both the groups. And here we took the, the initial uh, decomposition rates and sort of did like a first uh, order uh, decay, uh, decay model. And then um, here are three different simulations. The first, the blue one is, um, is that I, the, the decomposition rate for the blue one, um, I got it from the literature for anaerobic decomposition rate. So basically saying what would have happened if the peat was left in a peatland in anaerobic conditions. Um, the red one is, you know, like uh, peat in aerobic conditions. And the green one is the growing substrate. It's aerobic as well as when growing sub, when additives have been added. And we see that all three different uh, scenarios take a different uh, fate of their own and highest carbon loss is for the growing substrate. Um, but if we look at where we are in the first year, it's, it's, it's highest for growing substrate, but it's not as uh, instantaneous loss as uh, IPCC currently estimates. So um, to take away, uh, we, we saw that growing substrate and peat have very different uh, biogeochemical properties. And potentially because of these differences, uh, growing substrate have higher CO2 fluxes, and that arises from both direct contribution from, uh, from the additives, as well as indirect contribution from having made a nicer environment for heterotopic respiration. And also, um, also to, to um, understand liming history before measuring CO2 emission is important um, to prevent double counting and to accurately measure peat-based emissions. So uh, at the end, we can conservatively estimate less than 10% of peat carbon loss in, uh, in a year. And this was from incubation that was done as 23 degrees Celsius. So uh, acknowledgements, funding partners, um, peat extraction companies, and everyone at, uh, at uh, our lab at McGill. Uh, and yeah, and here's my email if you want to have any questions uh, after the presentation or talk anything about horticultural peat. Thank you so much for listening and I'll be, if I have time, I can maybe take a couple of questions. Yeah, yeah, I think we've got uh, just about a minute. If there are any questions, I'll open up the chat. I don't see anything in there. Uh, David, do you wanna unmute yourself then? Yeah, great talk. Um, actually, just spent uh, three years over in Germany, and like the a big issue there is like the I mean, the climate change is having a huge impact on the peatlands, and and already the the peat extraction in northern Germany has been massive in the last 400, 500 years. I mean, there's, there's huge losses there. So, um. Is that a potential that you see happening in Canada as, as like, because I mean, the German peatlands are, they're, they're disappearing very fast. And they're obviously going to start, if, if Germany is a major source of this peat, they're going to start looking for alternative sources. 
Yeah, um, no, great question. So it's a it's a very um, debate, like hot topic, especially in Europe. So I think also Germany has planned uh, to ban extraction. I, I don't know, I think to after 2030 or something uh, likely. I, I mean, I think like the key is to find an alternate solution. Um, yeah, until we have an alternate growing media that's available, uh, I think the demand for peat is is still uh, quite, quite a lot. I mean, just to add to that, David, in, I mean, it's very different in Europe than it is in North America, at least for Canadian peatlands, we have extracted over the entire history of peat extraction in Canada, less than 0.03% of our peatlands. Yeah. So it, it's not even really comparable to the European, where they yeah, you know, but... where it would be like double digit percentages, right? The concern is that 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 shifting demand is going to start to like obviously people in Canada are going to see that as a, a growth industry, but then obviously, yeah, you know, we we know the the issues with with that sort of level of extraction. So absolutely, okay. To keep us on time, uh, our next speaker is uh, Mikhail Mack, speaking on the vulnerability of peatland complexes in the Hudson Plain to permafrost thaw driven land perma frost, thaw driven land cover and hydrological change. Can you start sharing your screen, uh, Mikhail? Sorry, I'm muting myself. Yes, um, give me one second. Uh, so again, about the 12 or 13 minute mark, I'll turn my camera on if I uh, just give you a little that, visual warning. Is that sharing properly? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so my name is Mikhail Mack, PhD candidate at Wilfrid Laurier University. And today I'm going to be presenting on uh, one chapter within my dissertation uh, entitled Vulnerability of Peatland Complexes in the Hudson Plains, Canada to, sorry, my cat is <laughs> going right out of my desk, uh, to permafrost thaw driven hydrological change. Okay, so just a little background and sort of the approach of this uh, particular study. So in recent decades, the unprecedented thaw of peat plateaus in northwestern Canada's Taiga Plains has resulted in more basin runoff as permafrost-free peatlands increasingly connect and their over overall area expands. Um, so for our study to determine where or if similar land cover and hydrological changes are or may occur in the Hudson Plains, Canada. Our study analyzed peatland complexes at a higher order, uh, the peatland complex, excuse me, peatland landscapes at a higher order, the peatland complex. And we chose this approach because of the dearth of uh, hydrometric field data uh, for basins and uh, peatland complexes within the Hudson Plains, and the need to understand where permafrost thaw uh, may have uh, sort of landscape scale hydrological consequences. So we therefore conceptualize the hydrological function of uh, peatland complexes using circuitry analogs, uh, whereby each complex component, uh, for example, a peat plateau, a bog, a fen, uh, was then assigned a specific circuitry component. Um, so for example, as a runoff generator, a runoff capacitor, uh, conductor, resistor, et cetera. Uh, then using a distribution of peatland forms and peatland complex types, uh, we had identified across a large transect of the Hudson Plains. Uh, we assigned uh, vulnerability rankings at this seven and a half uh, square kilometer uh, grid cell resolution based on uh, the peatland complex structures and our understanding of complexes in the Taiga Plains and available literature. So just to uh, um, provide a little context about these uh, peatland complexes and, and sort of how we're using circuitry analogs to, to understand them. Here we have um, in the uh, Southern uh, Taiga Plains, a plateau uh, wetland complex uh, highlighted here in the red, and then you're sort of surrounded by 
uh, mainly upland forest. <clears throat> As sort of like a contextual, um, conceptual diagram rather, uh, here's that same complex uh, in the frame below. And um, we sort of highlight the different types of peatland land cover, uh, peatland types uh, within this complex, and then um, explain, explain their hydrological function with, again, those uh, circuitry components. So for a peat plateau, we characterize it as a, a, a runoff generator uh, with this sort of active layer controlled uh, variable resistor. So as the uh, seasonal thaw layer develops each year, uh, these the peat plateaus themselves become more and more resistant to uh, runoff production. Then if you look at uh, the small little uh, wetland here, this is an isolated uh, thermal karst bog, and it has uh, the hydrologic function of a runoff capacitor. In other words, any runoff that it does receive, it'll either store or uh, evaporate over, over the summer period. And then we have um, connected bogs uh, shown here, which act as uh, runoff switches. So if their uh, water tables meet certain thresholds, uh, they'll, they'll be able to shed water uh, to down gradient uh, connected bogs or to uh, the final peatland here, a non-pattern fen, which acts as the runoff conductor uh, moving all this this runoff produced by this this single peat plateau uh, out into the larger uh, drainage network, and then finally you can sort of piece all this together to form a circuitry analog. So we really took a remote sensing approach to uh, conduct this research, this study, um, and use sort of a variety of different. Um, uh, data sets and, and try to piece them together to uh, better understand um, how landscapes are changing and then also how they're sort of formulated within the Hudson Plains. So here's the Hudson Plains. This is northern uh, Ontario, at least this subsection of our study area. And um, we kind of had three main uh, data sets, spatial data sets that we used. One uh, represented here by this green segment was a, uh, a LIDAR transect that was collected back in uh, 2010. And if you see these six red squares, each one of those, we had a historic aerial photo from uh, 1975 or 1976, and then a sort of more recent uh, high resolution um, a satellite image uh, from anywhere from 2014, 16, or 17. And then lastly, uh, we had this, we set up this uh, uh, gridded transect uh, across the whole sort of encompass all of these uh, smaller AOIs, and then um, used a, a mosaic sentinel uh, image that you're seeing here uh, for uh, interpretation of peatland uh, types and also peatland complexes within each of these uh, seven and a half by seven and a half kilometer squares. So getting uh, straight into results. So again, we had this sort of narrow band of a LIDAR uh, transect. Uh, it was originally collected uh, for purposes of monitoring um, Canada's uh, boreal forest across sort of the whole country. Um, but in our little section here, which um, encompass parts of the sporadic discontinuous permafrost zone and the extensive discontinuous permafrost zone, uh, we used a sort of focal statistics to sort of find local topographical highs and lows, and then where there was a, a sort of abrupt rise in, in this LIDAR uh, surface of one meter or more. We sort of use that to frame uh, to sort of uh, classify potential areas where uh, permafrost peatlands uh, are located. And then we sort of summarized uh, the total area that those occupy along this transect. And uh, for the most part, we found pretty low uh, quantities of uh, permafrost peatlands along the transect, uh, keeping in mind that we're in the sporadic 
sort of southern discontinuous permafrost zone here. And uh, yeah, like I said, about 7% uh, average um, uh, permafrost peatland presence in this, in this subsection of the um, sporadic discontinuous permafrost zone, and then about 13% uh, in the discontinuous permafrost zone. Uh, but it did appear that uh, had the transect continued, we'd see a pretty large uh, increase in permafrost area. So then results two, this is the uh, part where we uh, classified our, our six uh, um, smaller uh, areas of interest. Each of them, um, again, with that historical air photo uh, from the 1970s and then the more present modern day uh, satellite image. And we sort of compared and contrast how their, their land cover um, proportions were changing. And um, for this particular work, we used uh, forest cover as at least uh, somewhat of a proxy of um, uh, forested peat plateaus within this landscape. Uh, although it sh should be noted that uh, there's, there's definitely upland forests as well, uh, which are permafrost free within these landscapes. Uh, but where we did notice changes between uh, each of these AOIs, we saw some disappearance of some um, smaller um, forested peat plateaus in, in the sporadic discontinuous permafrost zone. Uh, and then sort of interestingly, interestingly in the discontinuous permafrost zone, uh, we did see both um, sort of clear losses of, of thawing uh, permafrost peatlands, but we also saw uh, some pretty substantial uh, forest fire or wildfire uh, burn areas as well. Uh, but for the most part, most of the, the forest related changes appeared to be uh, more permafrost thaw related than forest fire. Related. And, and then finally with these AOIs, uh, we sort of uh, characterize their, uh, their dominant peatland catchments, if you will, uh, with which is sort of peatland complexes, and um, each of them are sort of ordered in a in a uh, hydrologic gradient fashion. So from the uh, topographically highest uh, peatland type to uh, the lowest, and we identified uh, five different types. So. Our sort of last bit of results before we get into this final interpretation of, of everything were uh, the Sentinel uh, 2A land cover distribution um, that we did across our whole transect. And just to like note some of the uh, major patterns here. So for the most part, what we see are, are permafrost free peatlands in the sporadic uh, discontinuous permafrost zone. Um, and if there are permafrost peatlands, they're almost exclusively uh, forested uh, permafrost peatlands. And then as we move north, we see that there's um, a, a gradual transition to more and more uh, unforested um, peat plateaus and pulses um, in, in this sort of southern discontinuous permafrost zone. Um, within the extensive discontinuous permafrost zone and continuous permafrost zone, uh, a lot of these unforested uh, permafrost peatlands kind of form intricate patterned peatlands uh, known as interridge bogs and fens. Um, you'll see an image in, on that in the next slide. And then a um, couple last things here. As you move further and further north, you lose a lot of uh, like very visible uh, permafrost peatlands uh, features as, as sort of this uh, very large uh, carex dominated fen takes over uh, as you move closer to the coast. And as you move even further and further towards the coast, um, it basically transitions into a marsh and an intertidal marsh. Um, so if we then <clears throat> sort of summarize all these these complexes that we were able to describe and find. Uh, here, I'm only going to focus on the permafrost um, relevant uh, 
peatland complexes that we identified. Uh, we found basically two different two different types. One, which is um, more similar towards the ones that you see in the Taiga Plains, uh, but it was far less uh, prevalent. And the other is this, um, the more prevalent form, which we've described as uh, permafrost peatland fen pond uh, with this added descriptor dispersed am amperage. So if we circle back to uh, the one that we see in the Taiga Plains and the one that we see less often in the Hudson Plains, we've sort of added this descriptor of concentrated amperage and this sort of indicates you have um, sort of peat plateaus that are, are altogether more connected as, as sort of one object. Um, whereas this other form here is, is very um, heterogeneous in terms of its um, changes in land cover, peatland land cover types within sort of smaller distances. And, and as a result, we sort of interpreted as, as having um, runoff that would be a little bit more dispersed relative to this other form. Got about a minute, Mikhail. Okay, okay, sorry. I know I was going a little slow there. Um, sort of lastly here is our interpretation of uh, peatland complexes vulnerability to permafrost thaw. Here we took sort of the literature, uh, sort of an average um, area of permafrost peatland proportions within the Taiga Plains uh, to sort of distinguish between uh, areas that just sort of have far less permafrost uh, peatland percentage than those that don't. And then we sort of sorted by uh, the different types of fens in terms of how resistant or um, conductive they would be to runoff. And then uh, finally sort of clipped off this high area of fen as, a, as an area that's less vulnerable. Sorry, I know I sort of rushed through that last slide, but um, thank you all for listening and, and I'll take any questions if you have them. Excellent, thanks, Mikhail. So we have, a, I think a brief, well, it's gonna be eight minute break now. So if anybody has any questions, we can kind of stay on, uh, but if not, we'll see you back in uh, about eight minutes or so. So Mikhail, how, um, if, I was kind of looking at your study map. How close to Ring of Fire did your transect run? Oh, um, our southernmost site uh, was uh, Coper Creek, and that was pretty much adjacent to where some of the exploratory um, mining's been going on. So it, it really does butt up against it way on the southern end there. Yeah, that's what I, uh, that's what I thought. Uh, just let me check the chat, but I don't see anything. No. Okay, so we'll reconvene in uh, five or six minutes or so.
Amy, are you there? And Anthony? I oh, I am, yes. Okay. And you're good with the Zoom platform and everything? I believe so. Okay. Sounds good. So I don't know if you heard earlier, but I'll turn my camera on at about the 12 or 13 minute mark. And then at about the 14 minute mark, I'll interrupt unless you're sort of on your conclusion or acknowledgement slide or something. But Sounds good. Okay, so we'll get started. Um, our next speaker is me, so I'll introduce myself. Uh, Pete Whittington from Brandon University, and I'll acknowledge uh, Vitaly Golubev and Colin McCarter, my co-authors. Uh, Vitaly definitely did the bulk of the uh, heavy lifting on this project. So this paper was uh, published uh, kind of mid to late last year, and uh, just kind of going through it for here. So. Who cares and so what? Well, we know that peatlands store lots of carbon and the previous talks uh, really highlighted that. That's mostly controlled by hydrology. Again, that was kind of featured prominently in the previous talks. But here we're talking about the unsaturated hydrology, which is really controlled by the soil water retention curve or put another way, RETCs, um, alpha N and L parameters. And so, if you've ever used Red C, you'll recognize that uh, figure there. And so typically, uh, unsaturated hydraulic conductivity measurements are made with five centimeter high samples. So we wanted to know, was that really the best? And how much do the soil hydraulic properties vary between species and with depth? And does that matter? So we took some big buckets of peat from a field site out in eastern Manitoba. That's Vitaly there. We froze them so that we could cut them into vertical columns, 15 centimeters high. We did eight of sphagnum fuscum and eight of sphagnum magellanicum. You can see the asterisks there. And we put them into our uh, tension disks. So we sandwich it between this top disk and this bottom disk, and we apply a uh, tension where the top tension and the bottom tension are actually the same, which determines the tension throughout the core. And then it's driven by the gravitational component of the head. Remember that the head is equal to the pressure head and the gravitational head. And then we just repeat this at various uh, levels of tension going down from four, eight, 12, 16, down to I think minus 32 uh, centimeters of pressure, 32 centimeters tension. So this is what it looks like in the lab here. We've got the top tension disc here and the bottom tension disc here, uh, kind of a counterweight. And we got the inflows and outflows over here. We then ran them all um, through the pressure steps. And then we took them apart and cut them into three by five centimeter cores, like here. So we had eight of the big ones. And then we would have eight tops, eight middles, and eight bottoms here, and then re-ran it. Uh, and Vitaly did all the programming for this little Arduino so that when the water from the outflow fills up this valve and completes the circuit, uh, it trips the sensor to open up the solenoid valve and sends a measurement over to the uh, Raspberry Pi to record how long it was since the last flow. So if you know the volume and you know the time, then you can calculate the discharge. And once the discharge becomes constant, then you can just back calculate using Darcy's law, knowing the pressure head of the, of the sample and the size of the sample. So what does that look like? Well, let's just take a look quickly here. Uh, we have top blue like the sky, middle like the earth with green, red like the core of the planet and the bottom. And then, you know, if you've ever mixed Play-Doh or paint together, you get that kind of brown, yucky, gray color. So that's all of them combined here together. And so we can see that at the, un, at the saturated um, amount, so this would be equal to the porosity, we trend top 
middle bottom. Uh, but the water content then trends bottom greater than middle, greater than top once we become unsaturated. And so we can add the rest of them uh, in here at each of the different steps, Fuscum being solid, Magellanicum being open. And you can probably think to yourself, well, isn't that just a soil water retention curve? And you'd be correct. So if you basically connected all the medians of those box blocks, that would be the soil water tension curve. So we see a fairly big difference between the um, between the um, 15 centimeter samples over here and down here where we have the top and middle being quite a bit higher sort of on average. So the key message for here is water retention increased uh, with depth so that our bottoms are holding more water than our tops, which is not surprising. Uh, and the 15 centimeter core on sort of average retain less water compared to the the average of the three by five cores. Uh, looking at basically the same figure, but with hydraulic conductivity on the um, y-axis here, we see the saturated hydraulic conductivity. Again, trends from it being fastest at the top and slowest at the bottom, and then a complete inversion of that. The smaller pore network um, allows for better connection of the pores. And so here, K on sat increased with depth, which was the opposite of our saturation. And the 15 centimeter core, not very similar at the higher, closer to saturation. So these gray boxes were off. So this gets quite complicated to look at this in re real detail. So what we can do is actually combine the hydraulic conductivity with the moisture content. Note the log scale for both. So this is moisture content on the X and hydraulic conductivity on the Y. And if we include all pressure heads, so including um, those at saturation, so close to the porosity, fully saturated up here, you know, I can't really see a big difference between those slopes. There's maybe some differences in the intercepts. So we also plotted this where we removed the um, zero data, basically these points here, to see if we could see a bit more spread in the data. And so there are some differences in the slope here. Um, and so if we look at this uh, at, for hydraulic conductivity, as well as for, oh, sorry, for all here, and then for uh, less than zero centimeters here, these are just the same data, uh, top and bottom. The bottom just include the 15 centimeter data kind of superimposed on top. So if you're looking at this, you might see some differences there. You might be deluding yourself. So we can always go to the statistics and look at the table. We have kind of a key uh, up here along the top. And what we found was that there was no real difference within a species, no real difference between top, middle, and bottom within a species, but significant differences between species. So top Fuscum was different than top Magellanicum and top Magellanicum or bottom Magellanicum was bottom, different than bottom Fuscum. So just because you have a statistically significant difference, we kind of asked ourselves, does that matter? So who cares, does it matter? So what we did was, and by we, I mean Colin McCarter, uh, who I think is on the call today, uh, we simulated a 30-day drought period using locally available data from Manitoba, some of my field sites there. We started with the model height of 15 uh, centimeters with a full core, as well as the 15, the three by five centimeter cores uh, with 100 nodes, so either one or three uh, soil materials. We simulated um, evaporation at two point millimeters per day and a sinusoidal diurnal pattern, basically no evaporation overnight. And we did our initial conditions based on landscape position. So the Fuscum up in a hummock and the Magellanicum kind of down in a hollow. So the Fuscum started with a 25 centimeter lower water table and those were locally determined elevation differences between them. So to better simulate the hummock hollow topography. And we got all of the parameters from RETC, the alpha N and L values. 
So this figure will get a bit more complicated in a second, but let's just get our bearings. So time zero, uh, time six hours, we have the uh, one by 15, so the full core, and then the three by five with the dashed. Let's not worry too much about this for now. Uh, basically, we determined that the using the 15 centimeter cores that the five and 10 pressure points weren't very reliable. So really, we're just looking at the solid and the dashed line. So let's look at the whole figure now. So we have zero hours, six, 24, 72 hours, six days, 15 days, 30 days. So we see quite a big difference between them. We see Magellanicum uh, kind of sticks, certainly um, higher pressures, less tension, less stress, if you will. Whereas the Fuscum, you know, by 144 days is already exceeding this minus 100 centimeter uh, pressure kind of threshold, uh, suggesting that it's starting to become a little bit more uh, water stressed. We also notice uh, not a huge difference between the 15 and the three by five, uh, maybe until we get to the, to the end where we have a bigger difference here. So the Magellanicum in red, um, not much variation, not really stressed. Uh, Fuscum, bigger differences between the two types of data and more stressed. But importantly, neither of them kind of exceeded minus 400 centimeters was when you might expect the sort of haline cells to, um, to dry and have desiccation and sort of irreversible death or damage to the capitulate, the surface. So we can actually then calculate a rough water budget, if you will, and we just balance the ins and the outs. So the evaporative flux out from the top versus the soil water flux in from the bottom. So again, Fuscum in black. And so even though it appeared more stressed, it actually lost less water through time, which suggested that it was sort of better at conserving that water. Was the Magellanicum lost uh, 10 millimeters, almost 11 millimeters over the same time. So the losses are limited in the Fuscum, which we think uh, represents its sort of ecological niche or the importance of representing the ecological niche uh, when modeling. And so the easiest way to kind of do that is through differences in water tables. But we were curious that if we change that, so if we look at this more complicated figure, I'll kind of explain what each of these lines are. So the, the blue there is the original comparison. That's the previous figure we just looked at. That is the Magellanicum with Magellanicum water table and Fuscum with Fuscum water table. And this is the uh, water balance figure, if you will. If we compare these two lines, then that is Fuscum in black, but with the Magellanicum water table. And the red line at the bottom would be the Magellanicum with the Fuscum water tables. So it's basically just swapping the water tables. And then if we want to compare further, then we can compare different species, again, Fuscum in black and Magellanicum in red, but with the same water table. So what we can kind of see here is really the importance of getting those boundary conditions. You could model them with the same water table. So here we have the same water table in green and the same water table here with Fuscum. And you wouldn't really see a big difference between the species because it's not really their ecological niche that, they're, that they've been specialized with. It's also important to note that if you swap the water tables, then you get quite a different result almost entirely, right? We have our Fuscum losing much, much more water than our Magellanicum. So we kind of highlighted the need to accurately represent the local micro habitat of the species. So the key take home message, as I just said, uh, the soil hydraulic properties vary with depth between species of moss. The tall samples have experimental limitations. This was a finding in the study. We didn't really get into it too much in this presentation for the sake of time. But we need to have the modeling represent the landscape position because the soil hydraulic properties do seem to be consistent with the landscape positional needs.
And so thanks to uh, NSERC for sort of site access and these people that helped with uh, species identification and the Brandon University Research Committee. Thank you. So I think I've got uh, about 30 seconds for a very quick question. If not, our next speaker is Amy. I'm not seeing any questions. Amy, do you want to start sharing your screen? Definitely. <clears throat> okay, share your screen whenever you want. Great. Okay. So Amy is talking to us about prairie potholes as transformers on the landscape, exploring rates of phytoplankton, nitrogen uptake, DNRA, and denitrification. Um, you can just see my presentation, right? Or do you see my speaker notes too? Nope, just the presentation. You're good. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> um, so hello, everyone. It's so wonderful to uh, be gathering again and learning about everyone's research. It's always a fun time, uh, but hopefully next year we'll be in person. Make it a little bit more, but much better. Um, I just finished my master's thesis at the University of Saskatchewan with Colin Whitfield and Helen Balch. Um, so today I'll just be presenting a real shortened version of my thesis work uh, titled Prairie Potholes as Transformers on the Landscape, Exploring the Rates of Planktonic Nitrogen Uptake, DNRA, and Denitrification. Um, I do want to start things off by acknowledging the theme of this year's conference, uh, Science Serving Society. I think this is there's something uh, this is something that often gets overlooked. Science is everywhere, um, everywhere we look and everything we love. It was used to, to develop the computers that we're using today, and it will be used to develop the technology of tomorrow. Um, it's transported humans all over the globe and even off the planet, uh, which is pretty crazy. But most importantly, it has helped deliver food to our plates. Uh, nitrogen fertilizers are the most applied fertilizer in Canada. It's used to supplement plant growth and increase yields. And without the science behind synthetic nitrogen fertilizer production, billions of people would have starved. Uh, so nitrogen fertilizers have now become an integral part of agricultural production and has nearly tripled the number of humans sustained per hectare. However, there is a pretty big trade-off and that's the health of our ecosystems. Um, I'm sure you've all seen news articles similar to these or experienced water quality issues firsthand. It's not anything new, but it does seem to be becoming more frequent. Um, these issues are in part due to fertilizers we use on agricultural land, but also on our lawns and our urban landscapes. And when these are applied in excess or during intense rain events, these compounds can wash off the landscape and into lakes and rivers and disrupt our natural ecosystems. This excess nitrogen can cause toxic algal blooms, fish die-offs, and ultimately reduce biodiversity. Fortunately, for us in the prairie landscape, um, we have a line of defense against this nutrient pollution. Our prairie wetlands can retain up to 90% of incoming nutrients, um, trapping them on the landscape. However, within this prairie pothole region, uh, which spans the three prairie provinces, there is over 70% of wetlands lost, um, and this number is only projected to increase with the changing climate and continued efforts to drain these wetlands. Additionally, food demand and fertilizer use is projected to increase substantially with our growing population. And so with the increase of these stressors threatening our aquatic ecosystems, it's really important that we understand how this nitrogen is moving across the landscape, what happens to these compounds when they're intercepted by wetland, and how we can further prevent this downstream pollution. So what actually happens to nitrogen when it enters a pothole? Well, there's a multitude of processes that may act on it. Um, but some of the most effective nitrogen retention processes are planktonic uptake, DNRA, and denitrification. Uptake refers to the uptake of nitrogen by free-floating organisms residing in the water column, where it's used and incorporated into biomass or used for energy. And then the next two processes occur in the sediment or in the benthic zone of the pothole. Uh, DNRA, or disimulatory nitrate reduction to ammonium, is a type of anaerobic respiration performed by microbes, which uses organic matter to reduce nitrate into ammonium. And denitrification, which is also an anaerobic respiration pathway, 
is performed by bacteria, but the nitrate is reduced into nitrogen gas and released to the atmosphere instead. And while we know that our potholes have a huge capacity to process these nutrients, we don't exactly know that to what extent. Um, is our nitrogen completely removed through denitrification or is it recycled through DNRA? Um, and how fast is this nitrogen utilized and transformed into biomass by plankton? And this is where my work comes in. So the main goal of my research was to understand the rates and controls of these key nitrogen cycling processes with three main objectives. Number one was to measure the nitrogen uptake by plankton and understand how fast inorganic nitrogen is being transformed into organic nitrogen. Number two was to quantify the rate of nitrogen recycling via DNRA. And number three was to quantify the rate of nitrogen removal through denitrification. I explored these objectives with a suite of 15N tracer experiments using pond water and sediment from the St. Denis National Wildlife Area, uh, which is an area over 380 hectares big and contains over 200 wetlands with various size, permanence, and physical parameters. So it's the perfect study site, really. And the first finding I want to share today um, is the diversity within these potholes. There's often emphasis placed on our light dependent uptake or uptake by LJ, for example, with little acknowledgement for uptake occurring in the dark or by non photosynthetic organisms. In this box plot, we have uptake on the y axis with each panel as the respective analyte, and on the x axis and represented by colors, we have light availability. Yellow represents full light availability, while the blue represents dark conditions. So, as you can see, the uptake in the light was only moderately different than uptake occurring in the dark. On average, the light uptake was only 50% greater than uptake occurring in the dark. Um, and so these results really point to the diversity within the pelagic zone, which can host a large proportion of non-photosynthetic organisms that play a major role in nitrogen utilization, and that often goes unaccounted for. The next finding I will share is the demand of, for planktonic nitrogen across seasons. Uh, here we have another box plot with uptake rate on the y-axis and season on the x-axis, and colors representing the respective analyte. The uptake of nitrate is represented in blue. And as you can see, it's relatively low compared to ammonium and urea, which are in yellow and green. Um, and so this suggests that the low uptake of, or sorry, the low uptake of nitrate suggests that ammonium and urea are the more preferred nitrogen source by microorganisms, but also may allude to analyte availability since potholes uh, in low land use zones usually have lower nitrate concentrations, and those communities may have adapted the diets according to that. Um, but I am also going to divert your attention to the ammonium and urea. So here we can see there is a pronounced change between uh, summer and fall and spring. And this dramatic change points to the increased demand for nitrogen in the summer. So given the increased daylight duration and the well-established phytoplankton communities, but this also may lead to bacterial communities within the open water zone uh, because these communities are more affected by temperature and therefore exhibit the fastest growth and the highest nitrogen demand when the temperatures are warm. And so if we couple the large phytoplankton communities and the temperature sensitive communities, we can see the demand for nitrogen in the summer is very, very high. And in fact, in the summer, the supplied nitrogen was taken up in a matter of seconds to minutes. And these are among some of the fastest recorded nitrogen uptake rates. And so in summary, we found that the open water zone has a very high potential for nitrogen utilization. It's likely that there's a large proportion of uptake occurring in the dark, which may play a larger role than we previously considered. Um, we also saw obvious preference for ammonium and urea, which can be utilized within minutes, while very little nitrate was, uptake was occurring. And lastly, we saw a big seasonal shift with a change in temperature, alluding to increased demand and temperature sensitive communities. And so within the open water zone of potholes, it's likely that there's a multitude of organisms using nitrogen at different times of the day, across a range of temperatures and in variable conditions. And all of these factors dramatically affect the amount of nitrogen available and how it's used. So next I'm going to touch on the activity in the benthic zone. Um, this plot is a little bit different, but it's very useful for what I'm about to talk about. Uh, the right panel is the full scale plot while the panel on the left is a magnified portion of that data. On the y-axis, we have the rate, and on the x-axis, we have the site, and the yellow triangles represent denitrification, while the blue circles represent DNRA. And so as you can see, on the left inset, it's almost exclusively denitrification, while on the right, 
panel, we see mostly DNR8, which are substantially greater than denitrification for most sites. And this dramatic difference is in part due to the competition between these two processes. They both use nitrate and organic matter to carry out their pathways. And by the looks of this plot, DNR8 is out competing denitrification for those resources. But we also wanted to know why that was. And what we found suggests that the sediment characteristics play a major role in the governing processes, um, the governing processes between, between this competition. Uh, similar to the previous plot, rate is on the y-axis with a magnified panel on the left and the representative colors for DNRA and denitrification. Uh, but we have the ratio of sediment organic carbon to nitrate across the x-axis. Here we see the highest DNRA rates were found in ponds with the highest carbon to nitrate ratios at 6.4 and 7.5 found in the blue circle. Uh, so this is consistent with the growing consensus that DNRA is, preferred, is the preferred pathway when the organic carbon to nitrate ratio is above four. Conversely, at ratios lower than four, denitrification is thought to dominate. And although denitrification was only observed to be greater than DNRA in one pond, that pond did have a ratio of 3.3 and is identified by that yellow circle. And so we can see at the smaller ratios, denitrification activity may be stronger while DNRA activity is reduced. But in conditions with high carbon relative to nitrate, DNRA activity is substantially greater than that of, den of denitrification. And so in summary, we found that DNRA is substantially greater than denitrification in these pothole ponds. And while abundance of organic carbon relative to nitrate can be contributing to this competition, there are some other conditions across the prairie pothole region um, that also contribute to this competition, such as iron and sulfate. So given these factors, it's likely that DNRA is the main reducing pathway in potholes, which means that nitrogen is being recycled rather than removed from the system. And although the preference from a water quality standpoint is for the complete removal, this pathway is still really important in, for transforming nitrate into a less mobile form. The produced ammonium is then available to vegetation, plankton, or absorbed to the sediments, and so it can still ultimately be stabilized on the landscape. And so what does this all really tell us about the fate of nitrogen in prairie potholes? Well, it's likely that the ponds are nitrogen limited and they have a very high potential to utilize nitrogen within the system. In the open water zone, plankton can take up and stabilize ammonium and urea within minutes in the light and in the dark conditions. And while nitrate is of lesser preference and of lower and lower uptake rates in the open water zone, there's still a high potential for utilization in the benthic zone. So the nitrate that does reach the benthic zone is likely converted to ammonium via DNRA with very little amounts of nitrogen actually being removed by denitrification. And so while the complete removal would be ideal, we can't discredit those processes that have a huge potential to trap nitrogen and transform it into a more stable or useful form, harness it on the landscape and ultimately mitigate the downstream pollution. And so in closing, I just want to revisit the theme of science serving society because we have come so far. However, we are still facing problems of eutrophication and toxic algal blooms, which is exacerbated by our nutrient runoff from crop and animal production and all the other sources like fertilized lawns and urban runoff. These compounds are in such excess that they're polluting our freshwater sources. And so I think it's time that science and society start serving the environment so we can sustain the health of the planet that sustains us. That is everything, thank you. Excellent, thanks, Amy. Does anybody have any questions for Amy before we get into our last speaker? I don't see any. So I will remind uh, those hydrology section members that we have our AGM at 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, tonight, the Zoom link was sent out uh, last week, I believe. Anthony, do you want to just start sharing your screen? I've only got a minute. Uh, yep, yeah, I can get going here. 
Okay. Um, yeah, well, here we we'll, we'll just we'll just wait in case people are popping in. Okay. We'll get going in twenty seconds or so, just in case people are uh, switching sessions. Okay, our last speaker of the session is uh, Anthony Barron talking about disentangling multiple drivers of dissolved organic matter concentration in a prairie drinking water reservoir. Go ahead, Anthony. Thanks. Um, yeah, so my name is Anthony Barron. I'm a master's student at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, and yeah, I'm going to be talking about dissolved organic carbon today. Um, and it's kind of it's drivers and effects on um, drinking water treatment in the prairies. Um, and I just want to acknowledge um, a couple of funding sources, Global Water Futures and NSERC, as well as the Buffalo Pound Water Treatment Corporation for their cooperation and all the data and uh, knowledge they provided, um, as well as my supervisors, uh, Helen Welch and Colin Whitfield. Um, and I just want to do a quick land acknowledgement. Um, so I live and work in Saskatoon, uh, which is on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. Um, and the Buffalo Water, or Buffalo Pound Water Treatment Plant, um, where we collect all the data and everything, is situated on Treaty 4 territory um, and the homeland of the Nahiyawak, the Anishinaabek, and Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the Métis and Michif Nation. Um, so I just want to start with uh, um, a map of my study area um, and highlight a couple of things. So, so Buffalo Pound is right in the middle of the prairies um, down south in Saskatchewan. Um, and the, the large map here shows in gray the, the gross um, drainage area. And then in yellow, we've got the effective area. Um, and you can see that it's much smaller than the gross area. Um, and from this map, it looks like there's a lot of tributaries that um, contribute uh, flow to the Coppell River, but in reality, um, it looks something more like this. Um, or actually, I'll get to that in a sec. But yeah, a few more things about um, Buffalo Pound. Um, it's a drinking water source for 250,000 people in the province, um, about a quarter of the population. Um, being in the prairies, it's um, naturally eutrophic, um, but also has excess nutrient input from agri agricultural activity, um, and it has a pretty long and um, frequent history of um, toxic algal blooms as well. Um, it's got a pretty short water residence time, which is kind of a product of its size um, and its shape, um, and the flows being managed um, from flows from Lake Diefenbaker, which is up on the left in the map. Um, and then it's also a prairie climate. So we get frequent periods of drought um, followed by um, wetter years. And that kind of has important effects for um, what I'm gonna talk about today, which is uh, DOC concentration um, in Buffalo Pound Lake. So um, one of the problems and one of the reasons we're doing this research is because of the impacts on water treatment um, that elevated levels of DOC can have. Um, so it can cause a lot of problems, um, excess costs due to things like um, added flocculators. Um, it can lead to bacterial regrowth in distribution systems. Um, it can cause foul smell, uh, bad taste in the water. Um, and can also lead to the production of disinfection byproducts. Uh, things like chloroform can be produced when DOC reacts with chlorine. Um, and this can uh, be problematic health-wise if there's prolonged ex exposure over years. Um, so there's a lot of reasons that the treatment plant um, is interested in, in DOC concentration. Um, and like I said before, um, it looks like here that there's a lot of tributaries that contribute flow 
to the Capel River and then down to Buffalo Pound Lake. Um, but the reality is it looks more like this, um, where it's mostly dry. A lot of those streams are ephemeral and only contribute flow in particularly wet years or during um, extreme precip precipitation events. Um, and so, yeah, when we think about Buffalo Pound and its, its watershed, it's something more like this, um, where we have continuous flow coming through um, the Capel River, um, and that's maintained by releases of water from Lake Diefenbaker. Um, but in, in wet years or uh, rain events, we can have flows coming in through Ridge Creek and Escuello Creek, um, and that, those represent more catchment sources of, of DOC. Um, and then we have Eyebrow Lake in the middle here, which um, can retain some water, um, keeping it from entering the lake downstream. Um, and the red tags here just represent gauging stations um, that we have um, records of flow for. Um, and my research question, the thing that I'm interested in is what, what drives DOC concentration in Buffalo Pound Lake? Um, and so kind of think it may be a combination of flow, uh, nutrients, um, and maybe sulfate as well. So now I just wanna show you kind of the data set that I'm working with. Um, we've got a very rich 30-year um, data set provided to us by the, the water treatment plant. So we've got DOC, sulfate, uh, phosphorus, um, nitrogen compounds. Um, and we've also got these, these records of uh, stream flow. So Buffalo Pound Lake inflow, uh, that's right above the lake. These Ridge Creek and Escuello Creek, those are kind of those ephemeral tributaries. Um, and then we have Lake Diefenbaker outflow. And again, that's, that's where flow is being um, controlled. Um, it's controlled releases to Buffalo Pound downstream. Um, and so one thing to note here, as far as the flows go, is that there's lots of these peaks in the, in the creek flows. So that's kind of um, a product of kind of the wet and dry cycles that we see in the prairies. And it's less pronounced um, in Lake Diefenbaker and the Buffalo Pound inflow, just because, um, again, these are controlled flows from Lake Diefenbaker. So um, you can see it's kind of, in some ways the opposite of the creek flows. Um, when there's high creek flows, there's less water coming from Diefenbaker. Um, and so that can kind of change the dynamics of DOC ending up in the lake downstream. Um, and I guess, yeah, one other thing to note here is when we think about what is driving DOC and we have these long time series, it's hard to, it's hard to pick out what might be the main factors here. Um, if we just run correlation analyses, we lose some of these, um, these kind of periods where one might be going up or one might be going down. Um, and so to kind of understand the changes in DOC and what might be driving it, um, I've used this wavelet coherence analysis method. And essentially it's, it's like a correlation analysis, but we don't lose the, the time aspect of these relationships. So it preserves that. And then we can see how things vary together over time and how synchronized or coherent they are. Um, and then on this slide, I've just got a couple examples of what time series in, in uh, environmental systems might look like. So we've got on the left here, uh, two sets of time series that are negatively correlated, um, but you can see they, they kind of vary together. Um, and then on the top right, we've got time series that are synchronized on long time scales, um, but on short time scales, they're negatively correlated. And then we have the opposite um, on the bottom right here, where on short time scales, we see they change together, but on a long time scale, you can kind of see there's not really a, a trend there. Um, and so this is what the output looks like um, of these coherent uh, analysis. Um, and they're pretty complicated. So I'm just gonna dive into one. Um, and this is DOC and sulfate. So out of all the drivers, DOC and sulfate were one of the ones that kind of gave us this long um, period of coherence. Um, so on the x-axis, we've got um, the time scales, which is measured in months. So we, 
have a period here from two to 120 months is the end point here. Um, and the output is a little weird on these. It's a log scale and it goes from, uh, it reads from right to left. Um, and that's just a feature of the package that I was using. Um, and on the y-axis, we've got coherence values. So the, these range from zero to one with zero being no coherence and one being uh, complete coherence. So higher values indicate a more uh, coherent relationship. And if we look at the black line, that's the 99th quantile of coherence. Um, and basically this is the representation of the null hypothesis, which says there's no relationship between DOC and sulfate. Um, and so what we're testing is where these red lines are above the black line, that indicates coherence. Um, the black line is the 95th or 95 percent confidence um, level, and the dashed line is the 99 percent. And then up on the top here, these bands are periods of significance. Um, and so on this one, we can see at very short time scales, we have significant um, coherence, but it's very low. So it's low confidence. Um, and then on the long uh, time scale here from around 10 to 120 months, we're seeing that these are very coherent. Um, DOC and sulfate vary together. Um, and that's over the full range of the data. Um, and again, just to point out that these are things that we can't really detect from just looking at the, the raw time series. So it gives us an idea of how they vary together and the, the magnitude of that relationship. Um, and we can look at that for, for a bunch of different things here. Um, oops. So I just wanted to point out that um, like DOC and sulfate, we, we can look at DOC and sulfate from the Lake Diefenbaker outflow, this kind of long relationship here. Um, so that's what's shown on the right is DOC and the Lake Diefenbaker outflow, uh, showing that we have a long uh, coherence here. Um, and similarly, we have this relationship with sulfate and the Buffalo pound inflow. But when we look at the tributaries, um, Ridge and Esquail Creek, things are a little different. Um, we actually don't see any coherence between DOC and those systems. And that could be due to the ephemeral nature. Um, and that's kind of where I'm at now is trying to figure out why did we see coherence in some places and, and not with um, other, um, other places. So kind of the conclusion from this is that DOC sulfate, uh, they vary together um, and with the flows from Lake Diefenbaker, but are uncoupled in the, in the Ridge Creek and Isquio Creek tributaries, as well as with the inflow to Buffalo Pound Lake. Um, so again, what drives DOC concentration? Well, it, it kind of looks like it could be um, mostly driven by flow from Lake Diefenbaker. Um, and of course, sulfate um, is a factor, but that's also um, kind of a proxy for, for flow. So what, what we really think is happening is that um, these controlled flows from Lake Diefenbaker are really um, what's bringing DOC um, into Buffalo Pound Lake. Um, and there's implications for that um, from a watershed management perspective, because it brings into question what's the, be the best method for um, maintaining water levels in Buffalo Pound Lake um, and how controlling flow um, kind of impacts water quality downstream. Um, and so this is just one part of the story of my, of my master's work. And so now we've, we figured out the magnitude of synchrony between some of these things. But what we want to know is what is causing these decadal scale increases and de decreases. So the next phase is this wavelet phase analysis where we can look at the direction um, of the relationships as well as the time legs. And from there, I want to um, kind of build a generalized additive model, which is like a nonlinear model. Um, where I incorporate the significant drivers and the time legs into the model. Um, and then I just want to acknowledge my committee, uh, John Mark Davies and Clayton Williams. Our streamflow model was done by a colleague, um, Ali Nazemi, and then Blair Kardash at the Buffalo Pound Water Treatment Plant, who's been a big help along the way. Um, and then just my 
my lab mates uh, in the Bigfoot and Sasquatch labs. So that's it for me. Thanks, everyone. Great, thanks, Anthony. Any questions for Anthony? I don't see any hands raised. I don't see anything in chat. All right, we'll have a good afternoon, evening, everyone. And hopefully we'll see some of you at the CGUHS AGM and the CGU AGM next week. Take care, everyone.